This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. My name's Anthony Padilla and I spend a day with survivors of hostage situations. We'll unearth the unimaginable terror and healing process after witnessing the death of 49 people during the Pulse nightclub massacre. How an innocent sailing vacation became a desperate mind game of survival when the boat was invaded by naval officers demanding that these tourists were spies. And the horrifying survival story of being held for ransom by pirates for almost three years. By the end of this video, we'll find out if they've been able to separate themselves from these events, forgiving those who held them captive and ultimately seeing themselves as champions of their own fate, or if this unthinkable trauma has catapulted them into a life of fear and isolation. Hello, Linda. Hello, Anthony. Michael. Hi there. Patience. Hi. Before the incident occurred, did you have any sense that anything was off? We had no idea that that was going to happen. We had a great time, and that's when we heard the gunshots. You know, the sun is shining, the sky is blue, the sea is beautiful, and we had no idea what was round the metaphoric corner. Someone seemed to recognize me by name, and that told me that my name had been circulating. And this complete stranger said, wait, you're Michael Moore? You're famous. I'd published a couple of books, but I wasn't, I wasn't famous, in, famous in Somalia. The only explanation for that was that my name had been circulating somehow, and that was the first time that morning that I I felt like something was truly off. Before we break down all the details, can you give us a brief synopsis of what occurred? I am a survivor of the Pulse nightclub shooting that took place on June 12, 2016. And being shot twice, held hostage for three hours, and watching a friend die is something that kind of stays with you for the rest of your life. I went off with my husband on our brand new catamaran. We got close to an island that we didn't realize was disputed. We suddenly were intercepted by a couple of gunboats with Kalashnikov wielding Marines who were very unhappy to see us. In 2012, I went to Somalia on a reporting trip and on the way back from the airport, there was a battle wagon with a cannon mount mounted in the back. Twelve guys from the back of that truck came off with Kalashnikovs and pulled me out of the, the car. They beat me on the head, they broke my wrist, and they bundled me into another SUV. We drove off into the Somali bush for about three hours. And are you comfortable explaining what led up to being held hostage? Us sailing up in our big white boat looked suspicious to them. I looked up and I said to my husband, are those gun emplacements? I thought, ooh, I don't really like the look of this. They were shouting and we assumed it was, who are you, what are you doing here? I had a camera and they started pointing at it. I thought that they were upset because maybe I'd taken pictures. I exposed the film. They just went crazy because to them, that looked like a guilty act. They told us to line up and they pointed their guns at us. We were standing at the far deck and I guess the idea was they would shoot us and we'd just fall into the water. So many things kind of flashed through in my mind, like what a stupid way to die. The radios crackled into life and there was lots of shouting and then they obviously had another command and they told us to turn around and head back towards the island. I mean, my mind instantly went into denial. You know, I knew that kidnapping was going to be a risk at the, during this trip. It, it couldn't really be happening. Then these guys advancing on, on the car fired into the air. When the gunfire was over, I couldn't believe I was still alive. I wound up in this SUV that was driven by pirates. And the, the pirates drove off into the bush for hours. We stopped in the middle of the bush and it just led me to a mattress that was lying on the ground. At this camp, there were other Somalis with guns. And even though I didn't have glasses on, I could slightly tell there were other hostages. It was two bosses sitting there on the top of a bluff and they held weapons and put a phone in my hand and told me to demand $20 million from my mother. Eventually, my mom came up with a counter offer of $8,000. Can't make 20, but maybe 8,000. I thought, oh, this is gonna take a long time. But at the same time, I was like, oh, mom. I was proud of her counter offer. The reason why I'm here is because I would love, love, love to show you guys how even the most horrible dark storm can still produce some sort of light. I'm done reliving it. There's so much more to me than what I've been through. This was a, a tragedy that the world bared witness to. I think it's really strong of you to have that boundary set up for yourself, to know that you are done talking about it right now. You're not going to 
give in to what other people want from me. I'm just ready to evolve. I've talked about it several times in other yeah. interviews, and I just really want to focus on the positive things that I could pull and share to others because we're all going through something. The next day, we were brought out on deck and we saw two big planes flying in. And then they said they were going to take us to mainland Iran, which obviously was even more frightening for us. We go on this plane and we fly to mainland. We're driven to a naval base with, you know, high perimeter walls, razor wire, all of that. And we're taken in and we're put into a safe house, living in the moment, reading my books, chain smoking, being interrogated. You were interrogated over 40 times. What were those sessions like? What were they asking you? It all came back to, why are you here? What are you doing here? Why did you sail up to the island? And they were not satisfied with the story that we were just going for a 24-hour sail. Why would we spy on your island when satellite looked down can, can see in far greater detail? But that wasn't helpful because they said, what do you know about satellites? The other surreal thing was that my, my son, he would draw coastlines. This was the notepad I brought to to use for paper. And they looked at this and they thought that I had been mapping some coastline somewhere. And, and this was evidence that I was a spy. You had all this evidence mounted against you, proving that their suspicions were correct. I mean, how do you explain that this was my five-year-old son's doodlings because he was obsessed with coasts, you know? No, like, no child is obsessed with coasts. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. We'd been told we were going to be released and we thought we were going to go home and then for it not to happen at the 11th hour it was heartbreaking because, you know, we dared to hope. We wound up staying in the bush out in the open for several weeks. We kind of moved around from, from then on for the next three months. When the sun went down, the sound of the mosquitoes would rise. I knew that malaria was going to be a problem. And sure enough, one morning I woke up and I felt like I had a fever. Your head is, you know, burning with fever, but your bones feel like lead. That took care of any of any spirit I had, and I, I just felt like dying. We got moved onto a ship. The crew was something like 28 guys, and all these Asian guys were looking at us, like, you know, who are these newcomers? And all of a sudden, we start to smell coffee and then fried dough. We just got coffee and donuts on our first first morning on this ship. This is great. And they became our friends. I mean, all of a sudden, we, we had friends and allies. There were about five different nationalities in the crew. We all yeah. learned to talk in this mishmash of 20 words, and that's how yeah. we communicated. I spent about nine months on that ship, and it was just kind of amazing, you know, to have that camaraderie. Did you ever find yourself becoming friends with any of your captors? Yeah, we did. These were guys that were trapped by their own, own regime. But you do establish a rapport with the nice guys. You're, you know, you're together 24-7. I think there are evil monsters out there, but people who are civilized and kind with you, even if you are being deprived of your liberty and being deprived of seeing your children, you can't think of them as the bad guys. Did the thought to escape ever cross your mind? I did contemplate trying to escape. I'm a good yeah. swimmer. I love swimming in the sea, but we couldn't have swum that. And it's all right if you're James Bond, but you know, running through the streets of Bandar Abbas in my bare feet, diving into the harbor, evading the gunboats. No, it wasn't going to play that one. I mean, every time we went to a, move, a new place, of course, I cased it to see what was possible. At the end of the summer, the ship started to give out. The anchor chain actually broke. That night, I actually found a way to get out of my cabin asked the guards to go downstairs and get some toilet paper. And while I was down on the main work deck, I kicked off my sandals and made a running leap for it. And I jumped into the dark water. It didn't work. <laughs> and I knew which way to swim to get away from the ship quickly. But when the ship started to roll towards me, I thought I can either play hide and seek and risk getting rolled over by the ship, or I can give myself up. So I gave myself up. And after that, the pirates put me in solitary confinement. Were there any moments when you did nearly give up hope? After the first year or so, um, I have to say that hope didn't do it anymore. I had noticed that the pirates would say, Michael, you know, in two weeks, you're going to go free. And then I'd wait two weeks, and then, uh, of course, I wouldn't go free. Your emotions are in much worse shape after that two weeks than they were beforehand. It's a breaking wheel of hope. And, and despair. To get off of it, I had to stop hoping altogether. Were there any things that made you laugh or smile? A couple of things were just 
hilarious things I heard on the radio. A giant rubber ducky that was inflated. It was sitting there in the harbor. They said it got attacked by eagles who popped the rubber ducky. <laughs> I imagine this enormous rubber duck exploded. Get off our turf, bro. This is our scene. And, yeah, and I laughed out loud. I think it's so interesting that you laughed so infrequently that you are able to pinpoint one of the few times when you laugh. Yes, exactly. Were you ever tempted to harm your captors? Several times. These guys left their Kalashnikovs lying around. And a couple of times they were within reach, you know, so you had to think. There was only one guard left in the room and he got up to leave and left his gun behind. That's like 101 guard handbook. Do not leave your weapon in the room with the hostage. On one of those occasions, he came back and found the gun there and he said, problem. He admitted <laughs> to me that he had made a mistake. I'm like, dude, I know. Jumping off the ship was a much easier thing for me to contemplate than opening fire. It's just that I didn't have too many other choices by that point in my captivity. I was so, at some point, when you think about drastic measures. Did you ever play any mind games with your captors for, for sympathy or anything like that? I said to my husband, look, don't worry about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stage this, but I'm gonna lose it emotionally because I want them to feel the pain that I am suppressing. I started shouting, screaming, crying. I want my children, I want my children. I had to disassociate from everything. So I didn't feel, I did not feel anything. And it worked because after that, they let us ring our children. These were the old fashioned phones. You had to tap it out. And I realized that in Tapping it out, I could actually send a text while pretending to dial the number. So I sent a text to our helper saying, we are being held by the Iranians against our will in Bandar Abbas. That's quite a long text. Especially because it's like T9, you're like pressing the, the, yeah, the digits yeah, yeah, exactly, on the phone. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then I got a text back saying, who is this? <laughs> Like, you're like, shouldn't you be able to put two and two together? So I had to then say it was Linda, and she could then get in touch with the British Embassy and say, this is the position. So then the British Embassy could get in touch with the uh, Iranian ministries, the foreign min ministry, and say, we think you've got some of our people. Finally, another ministry admitted, oh, yes, actually, we might. We pulled up in front of this five-star hotel. They wanted our passports because they said we had come into Iran illegally. It was proving very difficult to arrange an exit visa for people who hadn't actually entered the country. So I gave them the passports. And then they came back and they said, right, we've got you an entry. We're going to take you to the airport. Driven at breakneck speed to the airport. And we were put on the flight and we were taxiing down the runway and this guy in the car was driving alongside the plane, almost as if, you know, he wasn't gonna let us go. We didn't know. And then we took off. Were you on this plane with other passengers or was this just- Yeah, other passengers. They had no idea. And not only that, but we had kept the plane waiting so that we could all get on it. So when we, when we got on it, these other people must've thought we were real flakes that didn't get to the plane on time, you know? Like, wow, these assholes couldn't even get on the plane keeping us held up here. Exactly. The pirate bosses uh, settled on a um, ransom of about 1.6 million. And that was paid by a, a fund that my mother set up. On that day, the pirates said, Michael, you're going free. I'm like, I don't believe you. You've been telling me this for, you know, two, two and a half years. But a car came into the courtyard of the house. They said, Michael, you're going to go. We're going to drive you to the airport. I don't believe that when I see it. A series of drivers took me to the airport where I had landed two and a half years before. And there was a little Cessna, um, a bush plane waiting for me. He not only knew how to fly the plane and you know, knew how to get things done, but it turned out he was armed to the teeth in case something went wrong. So after four hours in the air, I was still not out of Somalia, and in Mogadishu, a, a U.S. Air Force plane, a cargo plane landed, and then I knew I was free. You don't spend two and a half years tensed up like that and just have it go away all at once. There was not a moment of elation, you know. It was, oh my God, what, you know, what now? Do you remember the moment when you realized that you were being saved, that you were going to be let free. When we're at cruising altitude, they come out, you know, with the drinks and say, you know, would you like a drink? It's like, oh, yes, please. Actually, that'd be very nice. Thank you. The three of us are toasting freedom. We get some very strange looks from, from some of the people. And we said, uh, we've just been held prisoner for two weeks in Iran. And they're like, oh, OK. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't <laughs> they even didn't ask any questions. <laughs> no, they didn't ask any questions. Before I left, they said, Michael, there's been an event, and it turned out that the two halves of the pirate network 
they came together to negotiate over the pile of money that had been delivered for my ransom. And they had a shootout that killed five pretty high-ranking pirates. So in the end, it was the bosses that killed themselves over the, that stupid pile of money. Did the media make it worse, potentially? You dealt with people who came up with memes and posted all over the internet that you were actually a crisis actor, you didn't actually deal with any of the, the things that you said you dealt with while you were still trying to recover with traumatic injuries in the hospital. When they started calling me a crisis actor and I started seeing memes, I'm like, wow, I'm trying to figure out how to communicate yeah. the message I wanted to send to the public so they know that I'm a real person. But in that effort, I realized how pointless it really was. They're placing a, a traumatized person in a situation where they feel like they have to prove that they're traumatized. It's really by the strength of God that I even have my sanity today. How has your life changed most since being held hostage? I realized I'd built some foundations for my life. The most important thing was the love I had for my husband and my three children. When the normal idiocies of life hit, as they inevitably do, God, don't react to that. That's not worth it. Forgiveness, prayer, meditation, writing. You know, all of these things play a part into me being able to sit here with you today and just talk freely about this because it was a journey. I love this quote that I found. I am not a survivor. That implies I'm still broken. I am not a victim. That implies I'm barely getting by the best I can. I faced extreme challenges and succeeded. So call me champion. Did you have a period of adapting back to normal life or has life never felt normal again? I was euphoric when we were released. Yeah. And then I got very depressed. I think it was because I realized that these things that you know I valued, the, the success and so on, weren't worth what I thought they were. You talked about how in recounting this story, it almost feels like you're recounting someone else's story. Like this didn't actually yeah. happen to you. And I still almost feel that. I wrote the book 10 years later and I, I thought I could write it as an intellectual exercise just right. to get the things down. I had to dive into everything that I had felt again and it, it did, you know, it was there, it was buried. There was at least a year of, let's say, physical recovery and a longer period of psychological recovery, which I never feel convinced that I'm out of. But getting myself back into physical shape helped with the mental stuff. Did you have a period of mourning the you beforehand? I definitely had a period where I mourned who I was before because I thought she was so great. It was a struggle over the last five years to really fight to be someone new. What kind of lasting effects do you think that this experience has had on your mental health? The psychologist who was at my side when I first got out, after a few days, he, he didn't just diagnose me with PTSD. And finally I said, are you here because I might have PTSD? He said, we don't want to put a label on anything. He correctly diagnosed that the idea of PTSD, thinking I had PTSD was possibly just going to add another layer of suffering. The fact that mental health always has a cognitive aspect. In other words, what we think we're going through is separate, if not different from what we are going through. Every loud noise, it was driving me insane. And I literally had to say, why am I afraid of this noise? Why am I afraid of the sound? Remember, that is just the sound. You're not still in pulse. You're not still at that traumatic thing that happened to you. And it takes work. It's not gonna happen overnight. It took me five years. Have you found it within you to forgive your captors for what they did to you? Before we continue learning about the world of surviving a hostage situation. I had to remember that even he was human. That even my shooter was a glimmer in God's eye. I'd like to bring your attention to a few other episodes that you might be interested in, like I Spent a Day with Kidnapping Survivors, Human Trafficking Survivors, and School Shooting Survivors, all of which are available here, as well as the uncensored podcast version of the show. The links for that are down below. And I'd also like to thank you for sitting through these sponsor segments, because without them, many of these episodes wouldn't even be possible. Speaking of which, Native is continuing to sponsor and support this series. Maybe you're tired of putting a bunch of unnatural stuff in and on your body. Native 
makes it easy to switch to a personal care brand that makes all their products with simple ingredients. They care about the products that you put on your body and are all about stopping the stink the right way. They create products that are made with ingredients like shea butter and coconut oil that smell so good, you'll wish that you could do so much more than just put them on your body. Native deodorant also checks a lot of boxes. Aluminum free, 24 hour odor protection, zero residue on skin application, over 10 cents to choose from, a cap, of course, that kind of makes that sound when you open it. Now is the time to treat yourself with Native. Go to nativedeo.com slash Padilla or use promo code Padilla at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash Padilla or use promo code Padilla at checkout for 20% off your first order. And of course, you'll also be supporting this series. And a huge thank you to Purple, who are also continuing to sponsor this series. Purple mattresses provide incredible comfort while you sleep by using what they call the grid, the grid. a revolutionary ventilated design that allows air to flow through it so you can stay cool all night without flipping your pillow halfway through the night. And let me tell you, that was my biggest issue before I started using Purple. My neck would be fucked, and also I would be drenched in sweat. The grid, on the other hand, supports and cushions my head, and now I look forward to laying in bed each and every night. So when you're done lathering yourself up in Native and you're ready to experience a whole new level of comfort that you never knew could ever exist on this plane of reality, it's time to get purple. And right now you'll support this series and get 10% off any order of $200 or more by going to purple.com slash Padilla and using promo code Padilla. Again, that's purple.com slash Padilla. And with promo code Padilla, you'll get 10% off any order of $200 or more. Terms apply, of course. Now, back to the world of surviving a hostage situation. Have you found it within you to forgive your captors for what they did to you? Yeah, I have. You know what, people say, what would you change about your life if you could? And I don't think you can cherry pick, you know? Maybe what happened to us saved us from something worse. I think there are things that people do that I would find unforgivable. This wasn't one of them. Psychologists would have us forgive because then it severs the ties between us and whoever we're forgiving. So we get to, we get to move on. Forgive is not the same as forget. I did forgive them in the sense that I, even while I was in Somalia, I stopped waking up with this burning resentment. You let that stuff go. Um, and if you don't let it go, then it drives you crazy. I had to remember that even he was human, that even my shooter was a glimmer in God's eye. And maybe somewhere along the way, life hurt him so much that he felt like he had to respond and hurt others in this way. And it makes me more compassionate for him because for him to do something this, this heinous, he must have been really hurt and really bad. I spent several years hating him and hating him created the, the opportunity for that fear to be produced and remain in me to where I wasn't living my best life. When you hold on to all that hatred that you have for someone, in doing so, you are almost attaching yourself to them. Poison doesn't come from a clean well. So if there's poison in us, then our well isn't clean. And it doesn't matter if we're justified, if we feel justified for having the rage that we do, it's still rage. And how can we truly show up and be authentic and pure hearted if we're holding on to all this poison? What do you think was one of the biggest lessons that you learned about resilience? You know, it's keeping hope and not blaming, not blaming oneself, not blaming other people. We all have a spark in us. We all have our core essence that's really got nothing to do with all these externalities. And it very rarely gets the chance to, to come to the fore. That essence was a great comfort. And I know I have that in me, that, that spark. And it is that spark of humanity. Everything you thought had defined you, that had become your identity, yeah. were stripped away from you in a moment and all you were yeah. left with was the deepest part of your humanity that had always been there, but had been covered up by all these layers of what you felt you had become. It kind Completely. of forced you to take off that, that cover, go down beneath yeah. the layers and, and find that humanity again. In an instance where you kind of, you could shut down almost, and, and emotionally in some ways I did, I could also open up to that 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 life force and because i had nothing else and if you're meditating on fearful messages of course fear and chaos is going to manifest 
in your life, in your body. So once we realize that we have that power to manifest all the, the bad stuff, right? I think we can just reverse it. So let me purposely think positive thoughts. Let me dream again. Does any part of you feel empowered by the realization that you have so much more control over your thoughts and therefore the way that it affects all of you and your reality? If you pray, if you forgive, meditate, write and connect with wise counsel, it'll totally save you a lot of time. You can choose to be strong. You can choose to make that shift from victim to survivor to champion when you want to. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly into camera. Go. The book where I go into all of this in detail is called The Desert and the Sea. My website where you can read about other books is called a Radio Free Mic. This is available on, on Amazon and I run financial workshops for helping people. They can go on my website and sign up. I have a Patience Murray talk show coming out this year and I have the Healing Her Halo podcast and also go to wowiceco.com. If people out there are interested, I would highly recommend that you subscribe to Anthony Padilla, subscribe <laughs> and get more, more of the same or better. Well, there you have it. I spent a day with survivors of hostage situations and I commend every guest in this video for having the strength and resiliency to talk about these experiences for millions of people to potentially learn from and apply to their own lives. And the other thing we did, and this was difficult because I had to wear the full shadow and, and a veil and everything, was we would do press-ups and sit-ups. And again, our guards watched everything, but we thought, you know, I don't want to fall apart physically. I, I need to do something. I think they thought that was ludicrous, but they didn't stop <laughs> us doing it. They're like, you're trying um, to work on your body right now. You're trying to, yeah. look, trying to look nice and hot. Keep it tight. <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it.